Section 14 of Bede's Ecclesiastical History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Jonathan Lang. Chapter 19. How Fursa built a monastery among the East Angles, and of his visions and sanctity, to which his flesh remaining uncorrupted after death bore testimony, around 633 A.D. Whilst Sigbert still governed the kingdom, there came out of Ireland a holy man called Fursa, renowned both for his words and actions, and remarkable for singular virtues, being desirous to live as a stranger and pilgrim for the Lord's sake, wherever an opportunity should offer. On coming to the province of the East Angles, he was honorably received by the aforesaid king, and performing his wonted task of preaching the gospel, by the example of his virtue and the influence of his words, converted many unbelievers to Christ and confirmed in the faith and love of Christ those that already believed. Here he fell into some infirmity of body, and was thought worthy to see a vision of angels, in which he was admonished diligently to persevere in the ministry of the word which he had undertaken, and indefatigably to apply himself to his usual watchings and prayers, inasmuch as his end was certain, but the hour thereof uncertain, according to the saying of the Lord, Watch, therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour. Being confirmed by this vision, he set himself with all speed to build a monastery on the ground which had been given him by King Sigbert, and to establish a rule of life therein. This monastery was pleasantly situated in the woods near the sea. It was built within the ark of a fort, which in the English language is called Knobherisberg, that is, Knobber's town, Afterwards, Anna, king of that province, and certain of the nobles, embellished it with more stately buildings and with gifts. This man was of noble Scottish blood, but much more noble in mind than in birth. From his boyish years he had earnestly applied himself to reading sacred books and observing monastic discipline, and, as is most fitting for holy men, he carefully practiced all that he had learned to be right. Now in course of time he himself built a monastery, wherein he might with more freedom devote himself to his heavenly studies. There, falling sick, as the book concerning his life clearly informs us, he fell into a trance, and quitting his body from all evening till cock-crow, was accounted worthy to behold the sight of the choirs of angels, and to hear their glad songs of praise. He was wont to declare that among other things he distinctly heard this refrain, the saints shall go from strength to strength, and again, the God of gods shall be seen in Zion. Being restored to his body, and again taken from it three days after, he not only saw the greater joys of the blessed, but also fierce conflicts of evil spirits, who by frequent accusations wickedly endeavored to obstruct his journey to heaven. But the angels protected him, and all their endeavors were in vain. Concerning all these matters, if any one desires to be more fully informed, to wit, with what subtlety of deceit the devils recounted both his actions and idle words and even his thoughts, as if they had been written down in a book, and what joyous or grievous tidings he learned from the holy angels and just men who appeared to him among the angels, let him read the little book of his life which I have mentioned, and I doubt not that he will thereby reap much spiritual profit. But there is one thing among the rest which we have thought it may be beneficial to many to insert in this history. When he had been taken up on high, he was bidden by the angels that conducted him to look back upon the world, upon which, casting his eyes downward, he saw, as it were, a dark valley in the depths underneath him. He also saw four fires in the air, not far distant from each other. Then, asking the angels what fires those were, he was told that they were the fires which would kindle and consume the world. One of them was of falsehood, when we do not fulfill that which we have promised in baptism, to renounce the devil and all his works. The next was of covetousness, when we prefer the riches of the world to the love of heavenly things. The third was of discord, when we do not fear to offend our neighbor even in needless things. The fourth was of ruthlessness, when we think it a light thing to rob and to defraud the weak. These fires, increasing by degrees, extended so as to meet one another, and united in one immense flame. 
When it drew near, fearing for himself, he said to the angel, Lord, behold, the fire draws near to me. The angel answered, That which you did not kindle will not burn you. For though this appears to be a terrible and great pyre, yet it tries every man according to the merits of his works. For every man's concupiscence shall burn in this fire. For as a man burns in the body through unlawful pleasure, so when set free from the body he shall burn by the punishment which he has deserved. Then he saw one of the three angels who had been his guides throughout both visions. Go before, and divide the flaming fires, whilst the other two, flying about on both sides, defended him from the danger of the fire. He also saw devils flying through the fire, raising the flames of war against the jest. Then followed accusations of the envious spirits against him, the defense of the good spirits, and a fuller vision of the heavenly hosts, as also the holy men of his own nation, who, as he had learnt, had worthily held the office of priesthood in old times, and who were known to fame, from whom he heard many things, very salutary to himself and to all others that would listen to them. When they had ended their discourse and returned to heaven with the angelic spirits, there remained with the blessed Fursa the three angels of whom we have spoken before, and who were to bring him back to the body. And when they approached the aforesaid great fire, the angel divided the flame as he had done before. But when the man of God came to the passage so opened amidst the flames, the unclean spirits, laying hold of one of those whom they were burning in the fire, cast him against him, and touching his shoulder and jaw, scorched them. He knew the man, and called to mind that he had received his garment when he died. The holy angel immediately laying hold of the man, threw him back into the fire, and the malignant enemy said, Do not reject him whom you before received, for as you received the goods of the sinner, so you ought to share in his punishment. But the angel withstood him, saying, He did not receive them through avarice, but in order to save his soul. The fire ceased, and the angel turning to him said, That which you kindled burned you, for if you had not received the money of this man that died in his sins, his punishment would not burn you. And he went on to speak with wholesome counsel of what ought to be done for the salvation of such as repented in the hour of death. Being afterwards restored to the body, throughout the whole course of his life, he bore the mark of the fire which he had felt in the spirit, visible to all men on his shoulder and jaw and the flesh openly showed in a wonderful manner what the spirit had suffered in secret. He always took care, as he had done before, to teach all men the practice of virtue, as well by his example as by preaching. But as for the story of his visions, he would only relate them to those who, from desire of repentance, questioned him about them. An aged brother of our monastery is still living, who is wont to relate that a very truthful and religious man told him that he had seen Versa himself in the province of the East Angles, and heard those visions from his lips, adding that though it was in severe winter weather and a hard frost, and the man was sitting in a thin garment when he told the story, yet he sweated as if he had been in the heat of midsummer by reason of the great terror or joy of which he spoke. To return to what we were saying before, when, after preaching the word of God many years in Scotland, he could not well endure the disturbance of the crowds that resorted to him. Leaving all that he looked upon as his own, he departed from his native land and came with a few brothers through the Britons into the province of the English, and preaching the word there, as has been said, built a famous monastery. When this was duly carried out, he became desirous to rid himself of all business of this world and even of the monastery itself, and forthwith left the care of it and of its souls to his brother Folin, and the priests Goban and Dicol, and being himself free from all worldly affairs, resolved to end his life as a hermit. He had another brother called Olten, who, after a long monastic probation, had also adopted the life of an anchorite. So, seeking him out alone, he lived a whole year with him in self-denial and prayer, and labored daily with his hands. Afterwards, seeing the province thrown into confusion by the eruptions of the pagans, and foreseeing that the monasteries would also be in danger, 
he left all things in order and sailed over into Gaul, and being there honorably entertained by Clovis, king of the Franks, or by the patrician Erkenwald, he built a monastery in the place called Latinacum, and falling sick not long after, departed this life. The same Erkenwald, the patrician, took his body and kept it in the porch of a church he was building in his town of Perona, till the church itself should be dedicated. This happened twenty-seven days after, and the body being taken from the porch to be reburied near the altar was found as whole as if he had died that very hour. And again, four years after, when a more beautiful shrine had been built to receive his body to the east of the altar, it was still found without taint of corruption, and was translated thither with due honor, where it is well known that his merits, through the divine operation, have been declared by many miracles. We have briefly touched upon these matters, as well as the incorruption of his body, that the lofty nature of the man may be better known to our readers. All which, as also concerning the comrades of his warfare, whosoever will read it will find more fully described in the book of his life.